Thank you for tuning in. My name is uh, Ariel bin Lyman Hanavi. This is a commentary to the last um, com, uh, the last section in Leviticus. The uh, parasha is called Behukotai, and in my written notes, I'm going to start at the bottom of page 6, and we are talking about the commandments. We are talking about the commandments because we find out in Leviticus chapter 26, what is known in Judaism as the uh, Tohacha, the, the rebuke. We find out that God warns Israel in advance that if they follow him and love him and serve him and surrender their lives to them, that God will in turn for his part of the covenant in the Mosaic uh, document, God will allow blessing and, and in fact facilitate that blessing into their lives and in the lives of their families, of their children, of their offspring, of their cattle, the land itself will produce, etc., etc. However, God warns Israel in advance that if they if they spurn God's ways, if they despise God's commandments, if they turn away from walking after the ways of God, because after after all, the heart grows cold and then we start disobeying. If they if they degenerate to this position, then God warns them in advance of the curses that will be released into their lives. Remember, God cannot curse them without a cause. And the cause is their disobedience. And of course, the disobedience is the result of a heart, grown, a heart gone bad, a heart grown cold towards God and towards His ways. So the challenge for us today is to remain open and warm to God's ways, to God's words. Don't, 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 don't allow your heart to grow cold. We talked about what the problem was. Now we're going to talk about parts of the solution, okay? This next section in my commentary at the bottom of page 6 is entitled Shomer Mitzvot. Um, and um, we're going to talk about what the term Shomer Mitzvot means here in a second. But in the introduction to this next section, let me say this. I want to address the complementary features between the covenant made with Avraham and the covenant made with Moshe. Because what we're going to find out is that the covenant made with Abraham gives us the... the imp uh, I'm sorry, gives us the... Uh, um, the paradigm to understand the relationship that we have with God in the salvific sense. And conversely, the relationship uh, uh, to the Mosaic Covenant uh, is going to teach us how to walk in obedience. Now, some of the, my material that I'm going to use is drawn from the excellent teaching resource and the, and the teachings provided by First Fruits of Zion. And they have a book called Torah Rediscovered, which can be purchased through their website of the same name. Torah Rediscovered, by the way, was written by Ariel and Devorah Berkowitz. They have recently republished the work um, under Shorsheen Productions, uh, publications, I'm sorry. I believe it's S-H-O-R-E-S-H-I-M. Um, if you have questions, write into me, and I'll, I'll just pass the information straight along to you. Ariel has recently written me in the last weeks, and, and after uh, surprising, to my surprise, Ariel, the other Ariel, Ariel Berkowitz, was uh, reading some of my commentaries, and he said, Ariel, uh, Hanavi, he said, Ariel, um, can you update your commentaries and let your readers know that we've republished the book? It's no longer available um, directly through FFOZ. They can actually get the uh, updated version through Shoreshim. And... Um, I don't have a book myself, so Ariel, if you're listening to my commentary, will you please send me a book? I've already sent you my address, and if you can get that to me, I'll pay for it afterwards. I just want—I need the book um, so that I can update my my notes and my commentary. Um, and 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 that's okay. I don't have anything against you. If you haven't gotten me the book yet, I understand you're a busy man. Uh, and so just take your time. I'll get the book from you sooner or later. Or I may just have to go out and buy it myself. Uh, but at any rate, um, having uh, uh, made you aware of that resource. Let's pull some information that pulls some of that information into my commentary. Now this next section, part of it shows up uh, on the website in another spot under the commentary set called Shomer Mitzvot, which the word, um, well I, I'm getting ahead of myself, let me just read my commentary. The Hebrew word Shomer means keeper of or to be observant. Uh, in the stem that it shows up, the root word is Shamar. Um, the word Shomer literally means keeping or guarding. It has the kind of the sense of the of the um, present tense verb, even though technically Hebrew has no present tense. It, it usually concerns itself with perfect and imperfect tense. That is to say, uh, th actions that have either happened already or have not happened. But this word shomer is kind of a cheater word. The o a sound in the uh, in the vowels there give us the idea of an ongoing um, action. And so shomer means keeper of or keeping or to be observant. In the call stem, which is its root, um, the word shamar, the three letters shin, mem, resh, uh, shamar, suggests the idea of safeguarding. And that's why we say keeping. Now, the information I just shared with you is according to the BDB, Brown Driver and Briggs lexicon. The Hebrew word mitzvot 
is actually the plural form of the word mitzvah. We've heard this word mitzvah before, as in um, bar mitzvah. The word mitzvah means command. Thus, shomer mitzvot means um, keeper of the commands or keeping the commands. Or more generically, we simply say Torah observant. Okay, with that little introduction, many believers, specifically Jewish believers, without a formal background in Judaism, in other words, Jewish believers who came to Messiah after leading maybe a secular Jewish life where they didn't have any training in Talmud or Torah or anything like that, um, but also pulled into this explanation to be Gentile believers who wish to identify with the scriptures of Israel. That is to say, Gentiles who have been raised in maybe a Christian setting, a church setting, uh, devoid of any, um, any um, focus on the Torah or on rabbinic writings or things like that. This is more or less a large group of people who are in the Messianic movement. Um, these people would naturally have questions about what it means to be Torah observant. When I talk about... Um, obeying the Torah or keeping the Torah. Again, if you were a Jew and you were a secular Jew, then you probably didn't concern yourself with Torah so much until you came to believe in God. Conversely, if you were a Christian and you came to the belief in Jesus, even at an earlier age, the word Torah was probably not part of your vocabulary until you started embracing the Hebraic lifestyle. So, pursuing the Torah as the master, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ modeled it for his followers, is sometimes referred in circles, um, referred to by people like myself as halacha or um, some people say halaha people who choose not to pronounce the gutturals uh, as as um, as accurately as they should be pronounced halacha or halacha depending on where you want to stress the syllable there and this word um, I call it halacha I've heard other people say halacha um, this word halacha stems from the Hebrew word halach which itself stems from the Hebrew word lech, which means to go. So halach means to walk, and so uh, the the verb halach, which means to go or to walk, um, gives rise to the noun halacha or halacha, which is um, the walking or the way in which to walk. And again, that's from the BDB. Now, in Judaism, safeguarding and keeping the commandments, keeping the Torah, is central to performing the will of Hashem. Okay? You can read Deuteronomy 5, verse 1 to see this. God does not give something that he doesn't expect his children to do. And therefore, when God gave his words and his ways, his Torah, he expected his people to walk into them. This, of course, is a challenge for both Jews and Gentiles, but particularly for Christians who seem to teach that the Torah is no longer relevant. So this is a challenge to you. Indeed, as properly understood from Hashem's point of view, the whole of the Torah was given to bring its followers to the goal of acquiring the kind of faith in Hashem that leads to placing one's trusting faithfulness in the one and only Son of Hashem, Yeshua HaMashiach. And again, look at my footnote to number 11, Luke 24, 27, as well as Luke 44 through 47, uh, uh, chapter 24, verses 44 through 47, and then couple that with Romans 10, 4. The goal of the Torah is the Messiah. The aim of God's laws is to lead a person towards the Messiah. He is the teacher of righteousness that the boy tutor um, is led to, okay? That's that's reaching a little bit into Galatians as well. Now, to this end, uh, that God gave the Torah to lead to the Messiah, to this end, the Torah has prophesied about the Messiah since as early as the book of Genesis, where we have the first Messianic prophecy, and Genesis 3.15, and it continues to speak of him until its conclusion in Revelation 22, verse 20. That's right. The entire Bible is about Jesus. Now, this part is a challenge to the Jewish people who choose to believe that Jesus is, doesn't have anything to do with the Torah. Okay? So first I challenged the Christian church with this idea that the Torah is relevant, and now I'm challenging the, the synagogue, the traditional synagogue, with this idea that Jesus isn't relevant. Challenge is going on on both sides of the fence, and now you can understand why we Messianic teachers are always walking around as if we're in pain. Why? Because we're riding the middle part of the fence, and that's the painful part. A little tongue-in-cheek there. In this capacity, what I'm talking about, the Torah um, acts like its etymological counterpart, yara. Now look at my footnote number 12. According to the BDB, yara is the root word for Torah. All right? And the word yara is an archery term. And the Torah, like the word yara, teaches its adherents how to properly identify with Hashem by helping them to reach the mark. Think of the archery setting, the uh, careful um, archer 
uh, steadies his bow, steadies his arrow, and he aims, he holds his breath, and then at the, at the right moment, he releases the arrow down the path towards the goal of the bullseye, of the target. And in doing so, he's demonstrating the concept of yara, that's the verb there. And so, Torah, like this etymological counterpart, yara, also concerns itself with making sure the arrow, which is the student in my little illusion, makes his way properly to the target, the bullseye, which is the Messiah. Do you see the connection there? I hope you do. And to be sure, if we look at the definition of the word yara and its counterpart, Torah, if we, if we look at its, um, the opposite of the word, then one of the most common Hebrew verbs used to identify sin is chata. And you know what sin means according to the Torah? It literally means to miss the mark. Look at the footnote to number 13. It's from the BDB on the word chata. So isn't that interesting? The word yara means to hit the mark. And the word chata means to miss the mark. And so chata gives rise to the word for sin in the Bible. And yara gives rise to the word Torah in the Bible. And so we can easily understand when John tells us that sin is is the transgression of the Torah. Now we understand. Okay, obedience to the Torah. It has long since been an oft misunderstood subject both in the Jewish community and in the Christian one. Okay, Jewish people have a tendency, those who are outside of Messiah, have a tendency to misunderstand the intent of the Torah and turn it into some sort of teaching um, to to gain some sort of merit merit with God or something to that effect, and they bypass the Messiah. Christians are, are are prone to misunderstand the Torah altogether and think that it is no longer relevant for their lives based on the teaching that's handed down from one um, anti-Torah community to the next. To be sure, in the first century, let's go back to the first century now, because that's where we're going to launch from our understanding of the Torah today. We have to understand where the people in the, 20, in the first century understood and or misunderstood the Torah before we can read the, the passages relevant to us in the Apostolic Scriptures and make um, some sort of, um, of application. The people in the first century, the Jewish people, I might add, um, in the first century, the Judaisms, let me just say it that way, the Judaisms of the first century, the prevailing theology of the Judaisms of the first century sincerely, albeit incorrectly, believed that genuine and lasting covenant status was granted to Israel and Israel alone. Did you catch that? That's the beginning of their error. The first century Judaisms held to this belief. Again, it was a sincere approach, but it was wrong. They believed that by, by virtue... I'm sorry, they first believed that the Torah was given to Israel alone. All right. And they believed that the Torah contained within it the um, lasting covenant status that they were seeking. And therefore, they believed that because they were all Israel, that they were automatically granted covenant membership based on being Israel. Now, to capture this concept, uh, or to convey this concept a bit further, I'm going to allow another teacher to, to um, teach for us. Tim Haig, in my opinion is one of the premier teachers in this area. I cannot recommend him uh, enough. Tim Haig of FFOZ Notoriety. Um, he has an excellent book entitled The Letter Writer. It's a thick read. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, oh, what's the word I want to use? It's a technical read. However, it's well worth reading. Pick it up at his website at torresource.com or pick it up at FFOZ's web, website at ffoz.org. Either one, you're going to get the book. Or if you can stop by our own shul, um, sometime not on a Shabbat, um, the, our shul in Thornton, Colorado, uh, we also stock the book in, a, in, our, um, in our library. Let's pick up the quote from Tim Haig. If the extant rabbinic literature contains at least some expression of the general viewpoints of first century Pharisaism, then it is safe to say that the prevailing Pharisaic view of Paul's day was that every Israelite was secured a place in the world to come. That footnote, number 14, at the bottom of page 7, is from Tim Haig, the letter writer, FFOZ Publications, 2002, page 85. He goes on to say, quote, All Israel have a portion in the world to come, for it is written, Your people are all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that he may be glorified, end quote. And the, the quote um, that Tim Haig uses in his book, The Letter Writer, um, 
if you look at footnote number 15 on the bottom of page 8, is taken from the Mishnah Sanhedrin 10.1, and the Gemara is um, uh, B Sanhedrin 90A. Um, again, the information that Tim Haig is working with is well documented. If you read through the rabbinic literature, the surviving um, Pharisaic literature, which is today known as the rabbinic literature of the Talmud and the Mishnahs, of which I'm fond of quoting, by the way. Um, I have nothing wrong with them. But what we find is that the prevailing halakha of the first century, we get an inside peek into how the rabbis and the teachers, or the proto-rabbis, I should call them, the leaders of, of, of the people of Yeshua's day, what theology they held to. And that's why I think it's valuable, in one sense, that we, re that we research the Mishnahs and the Talmuds, because the, the, the apostolic scriptures don't give us enough information to gain an historical appreciation of the first centuries. They do give us enough information for us to understand who Yeshua is and to make an informed decision as to whether or not we're going to follow him. Don't get me wrong. That's not what I'm saying. However, if we want to dig a little bit further into what the world of the Bible consisted of, then we must avail ourselves of extra biblical writings. Now, the verse referenced in the Talmud above, you know, notice how Tim Hicks said, for it is written, okay? It is written, this is actually taken from Isaiah, Yeshayahu chapter 60, verse 21, which reads, quote, out of the um, Authorized Standard Version, um, Thy people also, sh I'm sorry, the American Standard Version, Thy people also shall be righteous, they shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified, end quote. Now, if we look at this verse, and we try to understand where the sages got their influence for teaching that all Israel and only Israel shares a place in the world to come, we can see that one of the verses and one of the primary chair passages is this, this pasuk that I just read, Isaiah 60, 21. So let's exegete that passage briefly so that we can understand why I keep saying that the first century Judaisms towed this particular party line. The literal Hebrew of um, the phrase, Thy people also shall be righteous, is va'amech kulam tzadikim, and your people, all of them, righteous. And I inserted in brackets the word are and the word ones, because that's how we have to smooth out the Hebrew text, um, by adding the subject, and we also add the tense of the verb. All your people, and, I'm sorry, and your people, um, va'amech, all of them, kulam, righteous, tzadikim. And the, the reason I had righteous ones is because the word righteous can either be plural or singular. And so because it's speaking of plural peoples, you know, where it just said the, the previous word, amech, um, the root word is am, people, um, then we have to, the, the, the subject and the verb have to agree in tense as well as in gender in Hebrew. So amech, uh, your people, because it's plural, uh, the, the, the word tzadik there, which is normally the singular for righteous, becomes tzadikim. Um, which is uh, plural. So the translators insert, whenever you read in the Bible, the translators where it says, um, all of your people shall be righteous. Um, technically, the, 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 ver the, 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 the um, sorry, the uh, verb is not in the text. It simply says, all your pe and your people, all of them righteous. It doesn't say if they are righteous or will be righteous. Um, however, if you read the larger context of what Isaiah is writing there, the future context of the passage lends to the choice of wording. So I'm going to have to agree with the translator who writes it in the, in the uh, future tense, all your people shall be righteous. Nevertheless, the statement of the prophet uh, led the sages to adopt a position similar to the one listed in the Talmud above, where the Talmud says, um, all Israel has a portion in the world to come, viz. Israel exclusively shall be righteous. Now, in this capacity, the sages imagine that the Torah does not function to lead the individual to an imputed righteousness, the way the pedagogue leads the boy student to the teacher of righteousness in Galatians 3.24. Rather, the sages believe that the Torah is given to the person who is righteous already, either by birth or by conversion. And that, by the way, is a huge difference than what the Christian church is reportedly teaching that the book of Galatians is arguing against and reportedly teaching that the first century Judaism's believed. Are you guys beginning to see the difference here as well? I know that many of you listening to my commentaries have been taught for years that what the problem was in the first century is that the Judaism's believed that if they kept the Torah they would be saved. But I'm here to correct that teaching. That is an inaccurate 
portrayal of first century Judaism's problems. Oh yeah, they had problems. And I'm not going to imagine that some people at some level thought that if I just keep X, Y, Z, that God's going to love me all the more. That's not what I mean. What I mean, however, is that the prevailing teaching from the schools uh, of the first century Judaism's therefore was also adjudica adjudicated by the teachers themselves, uh, the ones who had made their way out into the community, the community, a.k.a. the Pharisees. They didn't teach Israelites that you have to keep the Torah to be covenant members. They taught the Israelites that you're already covenant members by virtue of being Jewish. What they were, well, what they were purporting was that the Gentiles who were wishing to join Israel first had to go through the conversion process in order to be counted as Jewish so that they could then inherit um, a, a place in the world to come. Now we're going to be examining this view in subsequent commentaries to this series, so if you're confused right now, don't worry about it. It's going to show up at lots of places as well. Uh, particularly, again, I recommend reading my commentary, Exegeting Galatians, which is available from this website. So, it is my understanding, having said all that, that the errors surrounding one's relationship to the Torah, remember how I described this uh, problem that exists both in Judaism as well as in Christianity? The errors surrounding one's relationship to the Torah can be corrected once a person resolves the issues surrounding identity and legalism. And after that takes place, he needs to begin to understand the intended nature and function of the Torah in the first place. And once he understands, then he needs to faithfully apply it to his own life. That's the solution to the problem. And because the Messiah has already come, we need to understand that the Torah is now a document that's meant to be lived out in the life of a faithful follower of Yeshua. Now, the Torah is ours. We inherit it through our faith in Yeshua, whether you're Jewish or Gentile. This is what Jeremiah meant when God said that he would write the law on the inward heart of the person who accepts genuine faith in the God of Israel, viz. Yeshua. The Torah gets written on the heart of the individual. Read Hebrews chapter 8 as well as Hebrews chapter 10. And so because the Torah is written on the heart, it is meant to be lived out. It is not, this is a challenge of course to the church, it's not meant to be jettisoned once we come to faith in Jesus. It is not meant to be discarded. But how do we walk it out? Are we supposing that now that we're, we're believers in Yeshua, that we're to somehow manufacture the strength and the... Um, effort needed to walk into the Torah? Far from it. Actually, we begin to walk it out through the power of the Ruach HaKodesh. That's right. The Spirit empowers us to walk into the Torah, and that's why it is a doable document. Con far from being a document that cannot be done like the church teaches today, it is a document that m most necessarily must be done and can be done. And how can it be done? Because of the indwelling spirit within each and every genuine follower of Yeshua. And all of this is to be done to the glory of Hashem the Father. Amen? I think that's a good place to say amen. Now, again, it should not be presumed by either Jew or Gentile that the Torah can be obeyed mechanically, that it can be obeyed automatically, that it can be obeyed legalistically, that it can be obeyed or walked into without having faith, without having trust in God, that is Hashem, without having love for Hashem or man, and without being empowered by the Ruach HaKodesh. I think I covered all the bases there. To put it succinctly, uh, succinctly okay, to state it quite plainly, Torah observance, that is to say, Shomer Mitzvot, walking into the laws of the Torah, it is a matter of the heart. And when I say a matter of the heart, I mean a matter of our willful obedience to God's ways and a matter of the Spirit writing the Torah on our hearts and a matter of the Spirit empowering us to do it. It is a matter of the heart. That's what I mean. Okay? It always has been a matter of the heart. And it always will be a matter of the heart. Look at my footnote to, to uh, number 16 on the bottom of page 8. I want you to look up at your spare time. At, uh, look in Deuteronomy 6, verse 6, chapter 10, verse 16, chapter 30, verse 6, as well as Jeremiah 31, 33, Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27, Romans 7, 22, and Hebrews 8, 10, as well as Hebrews 10, 16. And you're going to find the concepts mentioned there. Okay? God expects the heart to be the, the, the vessel that receives his words. And how can the heart receive the words of God unless the Spirit of God softens the heart of the individual? And how can the heart of the individual be softened unless the individual surrenders himself to the Spirit of God? 
It all works together. God gives us the grace so that we can place our faith in Yeshua. We're saved by grace through faith. That's what the Torah teaches us. And in this salvation that Hebrews, that the book of the Hebrews is mentioning, in the salvation process, the Torah is come to be written on our heart. It, it gets written on the inward parts of the man. I might also add, of course, it doesn't just get written on the heart. It also gets written on the spirit. It gets written on the mind. It gets written on the members. And therefore, we walk into Torah not because we strive to be um, accepted by God. Rather, we walk... <coughs> excuse me. We walk into the Torah because it is our very identity. It is who we are in Jesus. It is who we are in Messiah. We are righteous ones. We are tzedekim. We are, we are uh, uh, holy ones. We are kadoshim. And because we are holy and because we are righteous by, by Yeshua, not by anything that we've done or by anything that we um, are, um, then the Torah is easy to walk out. Okay? It's my desire that this continuing series of teachings that I'm, that I'm presenting here will assist the average non-Jewish believer, again, the average non-Jewish believer, that means the, your average Christian, or the average new Messianic Jewish believer, the person that I also described who came out of a life of secular Judaism and has now come into a life of, um, of Messianic Judaism. It's my desire that these teachings will assist him or her in, in their desire to become a more mature child of God. So let's quote Deuteronomy 10, verse 12 through 16, one of the ones that I, um, I believe I listed it there. Did I? No, I didn't. So let's quote it anyway, because it's a pertinent to my study. And with that, I'll close off section C, and we'll go into part D of this commentary and close out there. Quote from Deuteronomy, from the New International Version. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you? But to fear the Lord your God, notice the word fear there, um, yirat Adonai, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's what we say in our Shacharit prayers. Um, um, uh, yirat Adonai sechoto, uh, I'm sorry, um, gosh, off the top of my head, I can't remember it, but I do want to quote it. Give me a second, I'm going to turn to my uh, um, Siddur here uh, and just quote it. If you have uh, the um, Art Scroll Siddur, I'm reading from the Sephardic version on the top of page 3. Um, but after reading the opening, or after re reciting the prayer upon rising, the, mo the uh, Mode Ani, we say, um, and this is what we say, Reshit Chochma, Yirat Adonai, Sechel Tov Lechol Osehim, Tehilato Emeded Laad, Baruch Shem Kvod Malchotol Leolam Vayed. And what that means is, the beginning of the the beginning of wisdom is the fear of Adonai, or the fear of Hashem. Good understanding to all their practitioners. His praise endures forever. Blessed is the name of His glorious kingdom for all eternity. See, now we can understand in Deuteronomy when it says, And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you? But to what? Fear the Lord. That's the beginning of wisdom. And then the verse goes on to say, And to walk in all His ways, and to love Him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and observe... I'm sorry, with all your heart and with all your soul and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I'm giving you today for your own good. To the Lord your God, the verse goes on to explain, belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. Yet the Lord set his affection on your forefathers and loved them, and he chose you, their descendants, above all the nations, as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer, end quote. I could just go on and on in that passage. It's a great quote, a wonderful quote that challenges both Jews who do not have a love for God, a genuine love for God, and is evidenced by their, by their lack of sincere trust in the Messiah, as well as Christians who have a misunderstanding of God as evidenced by their distaste for God's Torah. Both groups get challenged in this passage. God commands Israel, both Jews and Gentiles, those who have named the name of God and have espoused um, eventual faith in Yeshua. Um, I don't have the time to talk now about um, the, the uh, temporal and eternal aspects of the covenant, perhaps in a different commentary. But suffice to say that Israel is comprised of Jews and Gentiles. And God is commanding them to, um, or expecting of them, uh, to fear Him and to walk in His ways, to love Him and to serve Him. And in that um, description is all that we need to understand how to relate to Him. And it's for our own good. That's what it says. I'm giving them to today for your own good. So, in my summary to the section C, um, to Parashat uh, Bechukotai, let me just say it this way. Because the Torah is written on the hearts of all who truly name the name of Yeshua as Lord and Savior, 
It is meant to be followed to the best of our ability. We have no reason for fear of condemnation or the trappings of legalism. And with that challenge to both Jew and Gentile, I'm going to call this section of Part C um, finished, and we will come back and finish with Part D to uh, the commentary, the Pahukotai. We are around the middle of page 9, and there are only 11 pages, so two more pages to go. It'll probably be about another 20 minutes or so, so stay with us, okay?